Well, you cry and you cry all alone at night, and you try and you try to hide from the daylight, hoping no one will see, wondering if they will see in your face the night before. And you run and you run. Bless God, bless God, and bless you. Now, I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes, and I am totally excited about what I want to bring to you today. You're at the hour of deliverance, and we're going to look at Proverbs 14:34. Righteousness exalts a nation. Many of you know the verse or know the piece, a piece of the phrase of the verse, but we're going to look at it today, and we're going to look at it in relation to the day. Now, I love to look at the word in relation to the word itself, but, or I should say, however, if we don't apply it, it does us no good. Now, Proverbs uh, 14, is a, it, it tells us about righteousness and how righteousness works. But if any of you have heard me on, on Proverbs before, I like to show you that whenever... Whenever God has names a trait or a person in the scripture, the wicked or, or uh, the ungodly, he also names the other people who are in, in play. If, or, or if, because I write plays, I think of on stage at the same time. You see, all of those people are in the earth at the same time. But for the circumstances that God lays out, there are certain players on stage, certain players in play. And there are certain scenarios, certain scenes, talking in playwright mode, certain scenes that go with it. And Proverbs 1 starts out with something that I'd like every wise woman, every holy, sanctified woman, every virtuous woman to hear well. Because you don't know that it's talking about you when it's talking about you. And verse 1 says, every wise woman buildeth her house. Wise women, you know that you build your house. The virtuous woman, his heart does safely trust in her all the days of his life. Your children, they rise up and they call you blessed because of all of that merchandising that you're doing. And it doesn't seem like you're running a business out of your own home. And yet, uh, you're dealing all different kinds of business building your house and you're not poor because y your maidens have, your whole household has. Every wise woman buildeth. And remember when we're using King James, that E-T-H on the end of the word means that it already is, it was that way, and it keeps on going. Kind of like the Energizer Bunny commercial that used to be years ago. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish, you see where there's the wise, there's always the foolish show up. The foolish plucketh it down with their hands. Now, we were having a funny conversation in church last night. Uh, the, uh, one mother, and this is a good mother, I mean a, a fabulous mother. She was uh, saying about the children when you... Sometimes you can talk to you blue in the face. That's an expression. And uh, I reminded of this scripture because, and several others to talk about the brawling woman. Wise woman, when you feel yourself going yakety yak, when you feel yourself talking and it's going, what's the other expression? In one ear and out the other. You need to know that for the person listening, the word of God tells us to minister grace you know, in that place where it says that you want to be able to give an answer to every man concerning the hope that is in you. And you want to minister grace to the hearers. When you're not ministering grace, understand that you're the other woman that is so contentious and the other woman that is brawling that the word of God tells the other person that it's better to dwell on the housetop. It's better to dwell in a wide house. It's better to dwell on the rooftop. It's better to be in the wilderness. When the wise woman is talking, and we know that it's going in one ear and out the other, we're being foolish and we're plucking our house down. Wise women, God has given you to know. 
Now, why do I say right? What has that got to do with the righteousness exalts a nation? The times that we live in and the nation that we live in. And yes, that we live in right now. But I'm talking about when the word sets things up, it shows us some things. And when mothers are named, it's because they build a nation. M mothers are named when they when the person that they are the mother of that the scripture talks about does extraordinary in a way that it's for a nation or for a region or for generations. And when I say extraordinary, it may be extraordinarily wonderful or it will be extraordinarily awful. So please know just the way God puts it here that the there's the wise woman, there's the foolish woman. Don't let them both be you. But wise woman, you can recognize, you can recognize by when it's going in one ear and out the other. Because God gives you, he's ordained to you, the word for your children, the word for your nation. Most of you don't even remember Hulda. Jeremiah was a prophet and he was, he wasn't a rough, uh, he was a tender hearted prophet. Now he was squarely on the word and the word of the Lord at all times. But he wasn't like some prophets that uh, they more had a sword than, than a hug. And there are prophets like both. But Huldah was who the king went to when he wanted to know the word of the Lord concerning the sin of the people. When the people hadn't been reading the word and hadn't been following the word for more than a generation and they knew when, when, the, when the young king became king, and one of the things kings are supposed to do is read the scriptures, have your own copy. And uh, today we would say highlight it, underline it, and your own copy. And you're supposed to read it at least twice a day. You're supposed to meditate in it. Now, we're a royal priesthood. So that's exactly what the body of Christ should be doing. That's why I'm letting you know that. What has it do, to do with righteousness exalts a nation? You are a royal priesthood if you are saved, if you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the king of all kings, to the prince of peace, to the king of peace. You are a royal priesthood and you need to know that what you do affects the nation not just your generation, it, it affects your generation. Not just your, your family, it affects your family. Not just your household, it affects your household. Not just you, it affects you. Not just you, your circumstances. It affects your circumstances. Not just your health, it affects your health. Righteousness exalts a nation. Many of us complain today about what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. Righteousness exalts a nation so that the pharmaceutical can't play the games and can't uh, put out pills that it knows are no good or knows it are going to do you harm 20 years down the road. Righteousness exalts a nation. Now, I want you to understand, I think I'll, I'll switch gears here on myself. The book of Proverbs presents God's truth and it distills the principles and the precepts to us. And when I say distills, uh, all of the interaction and the chemical action that happens when something is distilled so that it moves and it changes and it has life and it goes out and it's going to affect you when it goes in. That's what I mean by distills, the principles and the precepts. And I can't tell it to you often enough, Isaiah 28, 10, that when God says, who am I going to teach doctrine? Who am I going to show knowledge? And he might say it the other way around. Look at it, Isaiah 28, 10. I'm talking, actually, it's the three verses before and after. But he says, he that's weaned from the breast. Now, yes, you must desire the sincere milk of the word as babes, but you don't stay a babe. And uh, I might do a series on that, stay in babes, because we have chosen to do that in many areas. But righteousness exalts a nation. And the book of Proverbs presents God's truth for nations, for people, but we're talking about nations today. 
and righteousness uh, is a precept and a principle. It's not just how you think or how you feel. It's not just what's right according to how you've learned. I was looking at um, watches that I want to give as gifts. And one of the watches has uh, all the, the numbers that go on the clock, that go on all down in one corner. And it says, whatever. And I laughed at it because well, we're going to get up and show you about righteousness exalts a nation. If you don't know what time it is, not only do you not know righteousness, but you can't even be exalted, much less be a nation. Reason to believe This is the time to believe again This is the hour to receive God's grace No more suffering alone With burdens that are too hard to bear Jesus is here to give you hope Jesus is here to give you joy with his arms open wide and with eternal life, Jesus, he is here, right here. Mm -hmm. Don't leave, stick around. I know. God bless you. Now, I usually tell you, email somebody, call somebody, talk somebody, uh, call somebody, email somebody, text. Thank you. Text somebody. Now, I'm talking to you about Proverbs 14.34. And I wanted you to know the background on righteousness because the scripture tells us righteousness exalts a nation. Letting you know that Proverbs, in particular, the book of Proverbs presents God's truths in a way that it distills the principles and the precepts to us. And it distills the contrasts and the parallels so that we always know what's going on. We always know what we're supposed to be, uh, uh, what, what we're supposed to act like, how we're supposed to be. I also said what we're supposed to be because the example that I gave you in the very beginning of chapter 14, pardon me, I want to sneeze, uh, is that the righteous woman building her house but the foolish. It gives you the contrast, but also the parallels, because where there's one, there's the other. Where there's righteousness, there's also foolishness. You, you want to know that when you're talking about your nation, when you're seeking God concerning your nation. And watch in the second verse, he, he that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but, and God gives you the contrast, but it's also the parallel that's going on at the same time. The person who walks in uprightness is also going to encounter he that is perverse in his ways. It's not just that he's perverse, but he's perverse in the way he figures and the way he's going and what he does. It's not just the thing, it's the way. And, um, and despises him. 
That's something that you don't want to be caught off guard. There are people that despise the Lord. And when you're the one who's walking in upright in uprightness, you're going to encounter, or at the same time, this is in the nation as well, there are those who are walking in the uprightness, fearing the Lord. And then, then the contrast and the parallel, but he that is perverse, and I'm going to look up that perverse, literally or figuratively, just departs, you know, anything that is good sense, anything that is protocol, anything that is polite, anything that is human and humanity just departs from it, uh, turns aside. And so you don't have to be surprised when it ought to be this way. The person that's perverse, they're going to go another way. And the scripture lets you know it's not just what he does, it's his way. And it says he despises the Lord. It's not hard to despise people if you despise God. Righteousness exalts a nation. Now, there's many things to go through in that chapter. I wish you would do it. Go through the entire chapter. But I want you to see that these things are going on concerning the righteousness of a nation. So those other things, those parallels and those precepts, they're going on too. And... Proverbs in particular sets it up I, I, because we live in the day when we have so many pills, uh, not just potions, but pills for a thing. Um, I like to show you that uh, Proverbs gives these contrasts and parallels of God's precept in with these unmitigated facts. Unmitigated meaning they're irrefutable facts. They're facts that are, are to use an expression, in stone. They're not going to be another way. You can wish it was another way. You can wish the fool wasn't around. You can wish that the person who doesn't love the Lord, who de actually despise, there's one, a difference between the person who doesn't know him and the person who despises him. And the scripture lets you know that when the one who walks in your uprightness there's those around which who despise God. That's worse than the atheist who says there isn't a God. I'm talking about most agnostics have an axe to grind with God. I have something that they're mad at God and they're mad at the people of God and how they represent God. And we know that you're, if you're going to be angry, you're not supposed to sin. But most people who despise the Lord... They are in a state of sin towards anything God loves and anyone God loves. And I'm not saying that they're the devil either. Most of us forget. We talk so much about the devil when we pray and when we express things that we forget that in the thousand year reign where the devil is bound, man will continue to be so wicked that you would think the devil, it's a thousand year reign of the devil. No, God told us, in Genesis, at the heart of Adam, the heart of man is wicked, deceitfully wicked, continually above all things. That's, that's where we started with the fall. So you don't even, you need to move. We want to move in the victory that we have over the devil and move in our righteousness. And concerning a nation, because righteousness exalts a nation. So... The word of Proverbs, I mean, the yeah, the word of God, the book of Proverbs gives it to us in pill form, in outline form, in fact form, so that we can see it. It gives it to us in list form so that we can see this and we can see this. It gives us in, in the parallels so that we know that when this is going on, this is going on. It gives us to us in the contrast so that we know, <coughs> pardon me, this is nothing like that. And, and we need to get it. And they are God's principles. And they are not another way. It is the way that God gives it in his word. This is why we want to read it. And this is also why I read Proverbs. And those of you that know, I put up Proverbs on Facebook. On Rev Holmes' Facebook. Every single day. And I put it up for the day of the calendar month that it is. But give you that entire chapter. So that you can know how to walk the day and how what the circumstances are and using uh, the, the play stage, what the stage is, what the circumstances are and who the players are and what they're going to do. Kind of like what the script is. 
<laughs> what their lines are. You're not surprised. But it lets you know uh, these things in a way that like a pill, it's easy to recognize. You know what that pill looks like. It's easy to internalize, to take that thing. And it's easy to actualize. Did you hear what I said? When you, you go through Proverbs, you see these facts and they're distilled to you in such a way that you understand them so that it's easy to recognize, it's easy to internalize, and it's easy to actualize. That means to do. You know, remember faith without works is dead? You know, you've got to do, not just understand. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Sorry with this. Uh, now concerning righteousness, the book of Proverbs shows us what righteousness looks like. It doesn't just look like what you think or what I think. Remember, Romans tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, because already God had let us know that your thoughts aren't my thoughts. So concerning righteousness, most of us have uh, an idea of righteousness and a feeling of righteousness. But the book of Proverbs shows us what righteousness is, and it shows us what it looks like. It shows us what righteousness does how it acts. It shows us who and how uh, effects, who is affected by righteousness, how righteousness affects. One of the, on this verse here, righteousness exalts a nation. You see, if, if I love to cook, and if you have one spice, it's going to make you go, mmm. you have another spice and it's going to might make you sneeze. You have another spice and it's going to, mm, you see, their effect of something is is different ways. And the book of Proverbs lets you know how righteousness affects. And it lets you know the different personalities. How righteousness affects the wicked. Some of you are totally surprised that when you do right, people are mad. <laughs> righteousness affects the different personalities that are outlined in the word of God. Proverbs gives you the particulars. And remember, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That's Proverbs 14, 34, you see. But sin is a reproach to any people. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that. All right, and then um, it shows you how it affects the circumstances, not just the people. Righteousness can change some things. Do you remember when... when uh, uh, in the school of prophets, now that's a school of people that are righteous in the way that they're living, righteousness in their calling, righteous in their calling and their purpose. And yet what happened? Uh, the guy had borrowed, people wonder about a prophet borrowing stuff, but the guy had borrowed an axe. That's like borrowing a hammer. I wanted to borrow a hammer yesterday and I realized I have two hammers and a mallet. Why do I need to borrow a hammer? Because my... <laughs> Things went wrong with the hammer that I had. And you and I wanted to borrow. This prophet borrowed an axe. Now he's in a place he knows he's got to cut down trees and do this. He should have had his own. And he might have had his own the way that I had my own hammer and my own mallet. And still have. But he borrowed an axe to do what he needed to do. Righteousness is going to make sure that you're prepared with what you need to do, what you need to do. But oh my goodness, it fell in the in the pool of water and sunk. And he said to the prophet, what, what, to, what to do, what to do? And you know what? The prophet fixed that circumstance. Righteousness, when you're in a pool of righteousness, or when you call on the leader who's in righteousness, right things happen. And that ax had floated. The axe head, I have to laugh at that because I was trying to use my messed up flicted ha hammer and, and the head kept falling off. And I have a lot of um, glass in, in my home and, and crystal and stuff. And I thought, I am going to, to destroy myself if I keep trying to use this hammer. And I thought of the scripture with the axe head that fell off. It, it just flew off. But righteousness exalts a nation. Righteous circumstances will cause righteousness to float. I give an example later uh, in, in this, but righteousness 
exalts a nation. It's like uh, righteousness inflates, not with pride, not with pride, but righteousness inflates so that, let me give you the, the analogy of a, of a balloon in water. A whole lot of things float in water, but righteousness exalts. It's like the balloon that's full of, full of the air, the air of righteousness, that no matter what, it's going to, it's going to float to the top. It's going to, ex, it's going to exalt. It's going to move to the top. Righteousness makes it so that you cannot be kept down when you try to keep it down. That balloon, it's you, as soon as you take the weight off, there it goes. It goes up. Righteousness exalts. You need to know that if you're moving and walking in righteousness and if you think you're shy, well, that's just a shame because like Gideon, you might be the least of the least of the least and hiding out somewhere, but righteousness will cause exaltation. You'll be put in a higher place and you're just going to have to not hide because righteousness exalts. That's what it does. And it exalts a nation. Now, the book of Proverbs lets you know how righteousness affects circumstances and individuals. I already let you know those things. But it also lets you know how it affects policy and politics. How it affects law. And it lets you know the fruits and the rewards of righteousness in law, in policy, and in politics, in education, righteousness. Most of us are so busy being so religious and thinking about saving souls that we don't realize that righteousness has a place in politics. There's a right way. Listen, if you have laws that oppress people, God is against you wherever those laws are. If they're in your state, if they're in your city, if they're in your town, if they're in your nation, it affects the politics. Whether you're about saving souls or not, if your job is to do legislation in this and you oppress God's people, he has promised you that when they cry out, he's going to hear and he's going to take up for them. You see, righteousness affects a nation, a nation of laws or a nation of word or one nation under God. looking at Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And I'm giving more to the righteousness since we want to know how to deliver ourselves from foolishness and from unrighteousness, from the calamities that are happening in the land and in the law. 
And I'm already letting you know that Proverbs, while it gives specifics of God's precepts and God's principles on everything that it talks about, it lets you know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and who's going to do it so that we don't have to wonder. We can be prepared. So it lets you know uh, the specific location of this phrase, righteousness exalts a nation. When a person or a people move in righteousness, the principles of righteousness are governed by equity, by justice, and by mercy. You see, these are the major components. These are the major parts that make up righteousness. Equity, justice, and mercy. Remember Micah 6.8. I've, I've let so many different people know that when with what's our leadership that is at the time, we need to be praying Micah 6.8. And in there, God says, he's shown you, O man. He's shown you. This isn't people who are ignorant. They act ignorant, but they're not ignorant. He's shown you, O man, what is required of thee. To love mercy. And and you'll recognize that the world we live in, there are way too many leaders who are who do not love mercy. They don't care about mercy. To use an expression, they don't know how to spell mercy. Not in their language or any other. But God says, he's shown you, O man, what is what is required. You see, because you don't do it doesn't mean it's not required. So we, God's people, need to understand what it takes to move in righteousness. It's equity, justice, and mercy. So giving you Micah 6, 8, here's what to pray for yourself. Here's what to walk in yourself. Here's what to pray for your leaders on every level. And here's what to call on before God in the circumstances that are, remember, the, the wise woman, the foolish woman, okay? Remember that there's going to be the contrasts and the parallels so that when you know that you want righteousness to exalt our nation, there are the parallels that have nothing to do with righteousness. So Micah 6, 8, he says, I've shown you what's required what is required? Whether you're passing laws, making new legislation, whether you're trying to make a new plan to get through an old place. What is required? Love mercy. You can't just run rough shot over people. Maybe you forgot the scriptures where God tells you that he's going to do something about it when you do that. But you don't even you want to remember them because you want to be in them. You want to be walking in them. But when you're making the laws of the land, when you're voting on the people that you want to fulfill the different positions in the land, I'm telling you, you want to be thinking, love mercy, do justice, walk humbly. Now the do justice, that's mapping out the laws, mapping out plans. That's how to do what you need to do. Even when you when you um, put in your GPS, you're looking for when I'm just relating it to justly. You're looking for the right way that's going to give you the right end. You see, justice is going to do that. You're not going to be in an unjust place. I used to laugh at one of the the maps years ago when they first started. Uh, if you were in the States and then you said, uh, go to Puerto Rico and it would take you all the way to the edge of the water and then tell you swim across. <laughs> and we used to laugh about that. No, when you do justly, now that they've straightened the things out with almost all of those navigations, that now it's going to tell you justly. It's not going to tell you swim across a body of water. I, I used to like to plug in to get to London from uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> it was just hilarious. But do justly. And then he says, walk humbly. You see, when you're in a circumstance where there's no mercy around, but you're, you're the one full of mercy, and you know what mercy is, you have enough wisdom about you that you know what it takes to be merciful, whether you're talking about the health care system, whether you're talking about the educational system, whether you're talking about the judicial system, whether you, no matter what system you're talking about, love mercy. Then you're going to know how to do justice because every situation isn't the same and doesn't take the same thing. 
but you know how to do justly and walk humbly. You, you're not uh, sticking your chest out because you're the answer. God will use you to be the answer, but you know that it's he that's that doing it. So the components of righteousness are equity, justice, and mercy. What you do, what's legislated, how you carry it out, what the rules are. These things matter. They matter to God. And mercy. That Those are the components of righteousness. It's not just a religious thing. Righteousness is so in every arena, at every dimension, at every level. For every people, for every body of people, for every department. Okay, so... And this, I wrote this up, this part out, but I already told it to you, but I'm going to read it. It's like an inflated uh, pool object in water. It will rise to the top. Righteousness will always rise to the top. Equity, justice, and mercy will make a brand new nation rise in eminence, such as what happened with America. And in, poli in a politically raging world. Well, we still live in a politically raging world. Different politics and a different rage going on. But righteousness will cause us to rise. It will exalt us. Now, if we don't move in righteousness, sin is a reproach to any people. That's what God said. Sin is a reproach. We're going to look at that in a minute. Nations can be exalted by other means. This is true. They're right now, nations are moving up because of nuclear weapons. They're moving up because of beyond nuclear that nobody's reporting and paying attention to. Moving up because of mass killing of their own people. Moving up. But that does not negate the fact, not in any way, that righteousness exalts a nation. As in the pool, several things besides the balloon, if you will, rises to the surface. Nevertheless, righteousness exalts. Righteousness exalts. Righteousness exalts. It'll exalt you. It'll exalt your ministry. Righteousness exalts a nation. Now there's paralleling contrast to righteousness exalts a nation there, but he also says sin is a reproach to any people. And I'm going to check, is the but there, or was I just writing that in my notes? And you check too. Always check uh, the teacher, the preacher. Always check, because righteousness exalts a nation, but uh, the but is there. <laughs> it's in God's word. It's not just in my notes, it's in the word. But, and that's not a however, <laughs> Sinfulness is a penalty. It's an occasion. <laughs> it's an offense. Don't have time to go into all of that with you, but sinfulness, it's a reproach to any people. And I'm going to go with my notes here because for the days that we live in, what I'm praying for my country what I'm praying for the world you got to remember you've got to remember God so loved the world because for the things that are going on in the world right now they're so grievous they'll break your heart know that it's breaking God's heart but he has an answer God so loved the world I look and I get disgusted and I have to remind my heart to look with the eyes that God looks with it's not that he overlooks judgment, but remember the same thing he told us? Mercy, justice, humility. You don't just look and defame something and curse something. We bless and curse not. And that causes a tsunami of blessing to come and exalt. Sin is a reproach to any people. Reproach is something other than tisk tisk. Reproach is other than, oh, bad, bad, bad. No, 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 no. Reproach is much like when you eat good food. You need to know this. Reproach isn't just 
recognize. And by the time you recognize something that's reproachable, you've, it's, you've already accepted it. And then it becomes something other than what you thought. Please understand that about reproach. So reproach is more like regurgitation. Like when you take in good food, tasty food. It was great going down. But then something in a little while goes amiss. Something starts stirring that thing up. Now the something, the scripture lets you know. It's the foolish. It's the one who's foolish in their way. It's the one who hates God. And that thing starts stirring it around, stirring around, stirring around. And it begins to regurgitate. And any of you know when you regurgitate something, it might have been good going down, but it tastes terrible coming up. It doesn't taste the same way. No, it's awful. It tastes awful. It is awful. It tastes awful. Reproach is the regurgitation of all that was wonderful, that you thought was equity, that you thought was justice, but you didn't do it God's way. You didn't look and see what justice is in God's word. And so you ran roughshod over the poor and the needy. You didn't even consider the widow or the fatherless, which God says to do. And you thought you were being just and being fair. <laughs> and you thought you were having mercy on whoever it is you thought you were having mercy on instead of who God's word tells you. And this goes for a nation. It goes for a city. It goes for politics. It goes for education, not just for church, not just for a denomination. And I'm not trying to rhyme. God usually has me, so often has me rhyme in, in, when I'm in the prophetic but it comes up as malignant, partially putrid prejudice and excuses, justifications, and sham. Yeah, that's what, what's all that nasty stuff that's regurgitating. If it sounds like the day we're in, if it sounds like the news, what you rec want to recognize is that it's regurgitation. It's not new. It's the old stuff that went down as if it was right, and now it's coming back up. Remember God, Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're neither one, you may, tried to make that look like it was right, and it regurgitates as putrid prejudice and excuses and sham and justifications all throughout the land. If it is not checked uncharacteristic cruelties come up. Things that don't even characterize the nation, the land, the people, the area. Putrid. Putrid. Stinks. Nasty. Awful. Good for nothing. It stinks. It is a bad taste and it doesn't wear, wear well no matter where the regurgitation falls. You know, when you know that you want to spit up. <laughs> My husband was just uh, going through a thing before he passed that he kept bringing up, bringing up. And so he kept a trash can nearby because it got to the point where he wasn't, couldn't get to the bathroom fast enough uh, to put it in the toilet. But I want you to know that when that regurgitation of that stuff that you tried to label as righteousness it doesn't matter where you throw it up it's putrid and it stinks it quickly undermines the exaltation and the eminence that would have come with true righteousness when you try to make a thing look good and it's not good and when you get eminence and preeminence when you get exalted on things that are false, it's going to regurgitate and it's going to stink. So unlike trying to clean up the spit up, reproach is cleansed by repentance. Most of us know the scripture, Chronicles, if my people, which are called by my name, I'm going to finish this and if I'm going to share with you something about that, uh, if there's time, but it causes us to turn to righteousness if we have a heart for righteousness. 
Now, if we just want to be right, I mean, I'm not talking about right with God. If I just need you to think that I'm right, if I just need you to think I'm correct, if I just need people to look at me and smile and, and give me position and pat me on the back, that's not righteousness. Righteousness will exalt. Look at Joseph. He ended up in place and position. Same with Daniel. Righteousness does exalt. But if you also look, you'll see that especially with Daniel, not only were his three brothers, uh, his three, they weren't actually blood, they might have been blood brothers because they were royal family, but his three comrades, they were exalted too. But remember that there were others who were exalted and had position and they plotted against him. You see. Everything exalted isn't righteousness, just because you know that righteousness exalts a nation. But when the exaltation happens on false pretense, it's going to regurgitate and it's going to stink. It's going to be a mess. But when the righteousness comes because of turning to righteousness, because of, of that it exalts a nation, that is an unmitigated and irrefutable fact. And I want you to remember it takes mercy, love, mercy, equity. Equity isn't about being fair that everybody gets the same thing. Remember, remember the Passover. When, when a lamb for a house is a song that I wrote. But the lamb needed to be the size that that house needed. And if there was someone else who, who uh, uh, there's fewer in their family, even the division of the land. It wasn't equal, all things equal. Equity is not equal. Equity is appropriate to what is required. And I don't mean just barely. Remember? Look at the lilies of the field. They don't toil, they don't spin. It's what is good for you to prosper. Righteousness exalts a nation. Okay, I want to leave you with something on righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. And we showed you how that sin is a regurgitation of a false sense of righteousness. If you're not in God's word, you don't even know what he calls righteous. You think you do and you mean well. Remember uh, the guy who uh, went to, to study the Ark of the, the Covenant that when it was on a cart. Because... God's people hadn't been studying his word. They didn't remember that the priests were supposed to first sanctify themselves and then be ready to handle the cart. Not anybody, not everybody. And it caused death. He meant well. And the people meant well. But when you don't know what God's word says, you don't know what well is. Righteousness exalts a nation. We need to be in the word. Now watch this. God says, and we know this so well from Chronicles, if my people, which are called by my name, that is my people, God is talking to, not the heathen. Now, 
when you think you're being righteousness and you know what's wrong and it's always what's wrong with them they uh the government the 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 schools the teachers the police and these things may well be wrong i mean righteous people can usually point out some right things that are awful but watch what god says if my people which are called by my name. Now, when he's talking about my name, he's talking about walking in his power. He's talking about walking in his image. This is even before Jesus Christ go, uh, gone to the cross and, and uh, uh, dying for our sins and coming back again. This God said in Chronicles, okay? So this is a principle with God. This is a precept that must be upon precept. That when what is called by his name walks in power, moves in the power of God, the power that shifts, the power that changes anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, that exalts itself against the things that are not God. So if my people, which move in that kind of power is what he's talking about when he says, called by my name, but watch called by my name. And he says, humble themselves. Remember righteousness exalts a nation. But you have to humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. And it's not, it's not righteousness when you're so busy being shy that you will not allow God to exalt you and put you in position. God wants you in position as opposed to the person who's proud and arrogant. So it is, it's not a badge of honor to run from the will of God. It's he that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Aren't you about his good pleasure? Righteousness exalts a nation. Some of you who would never take position don't want all eyes on you. But that's what the exaltation. But if my people, which are called by my name, okay, called by my name, the power to move, the power to make change, would humble themselves. Remember? What, love just love mercy do justice walk humbly god works with humility moses is called the meekest man in the earth he brought out more people than anybody in one time being meek and meek isn't talking about being weak it's to being teachable being humble even when you have this one coming against you and or even when you can stand toe to toe with that one if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. When we humble ourselves, now he's talking about my people. He's talking about leaders. We all have prayers that we know that we pray. God taught me how to pray the word decades ago. But when he's talking about healing a, healing a nation, exalting a nation, when we humble ourselves, instead of going to the prayers that we know how to pray, God shows us what needs to be prayed what we need to seek him for. And he says, seek my face. He shows us what prayers are going to cause us to seek his face. And why do we need to seek his face? Let me use Isaiah as an example. You cannot find anything against <coughs> the prophet Isaiah in the scripture. He was a righteous prophet. And yet, when King Uzziah died, he said that he was in the temple and he saw the spirit of the Lord and the, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And he, and he said in the presence of the Lord, in the glory of the Lord, he said, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And I'm among a people unclean. You see, when we find ourselves finding what's wrong with everybody else, pointing at everything else, and we might be correct about what's wrong with that. But when we're in the presence of God, we see that I'm unclean before we even see that we are unclean. And then we have the what to do about it. We turn from our wicked ways. You're not the one that turns somebody from their wicked ways. It's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost that convinces the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's God's way. Not us pointing out everything wrong. The goodness of God leads men to repentance. So if my people, which are called by my name, that power, humble ourselves instead of doing our prayers and our daily duty that we know to do, then we begin to seek God's face and 
Ah, in his presence, we repent from our wicked ways. And he says, I'll hear from heaven. When are we going to recognize that we have from heaven, in the heavenlies, these storms and these winds, uh, winds that cause fires to, to destroy so much land, so much forest. Our prices are high at the supermarket because of the weather being wrong. Thing in the heavenlies. God said, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. The storm will go out to the sea. The hurricane will go elsewhere. Or it will cease. Rather than take up, uh, destroy your mother's house, your mother-in-law's house, your cousin's house. How close does it have to come for we, his people, to humble ourselves and hear from God what it is we need to be praying? He says, I'll hear from heaven. And those calamities will stop. And he says, I'll heal the land. We need God to hear from heaven right now. All these storms and calamities. All these hurricanes. And then causing different kinds of earthquakes. He says, I'll hear from heaven. I'll heal the land. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. And when we don't, all of these calamities will continue to happen. And that's what we're praying for. We're taken up with praying for. And yes, you should pray when it, it happens in Indiana where your mother lives. Or it happened in Texas where your father-in-law lives. And it, so it has you praying for them and praying for that. So that we're not praying on the thing that is righteousness. That will bring that, arrest the unrighteousness and bring it into order. That's if my people who are called by my name, the power of his name, if we humble ourselves, we'll know what to pray. We'll know how to seek his face. We're leaders that he's talking to. We know these things. We know how to do these things. We know the things that God has taught us. But in the circumstance, in the circumstance, righteousness exalts a nation. And if we keep on sinning because we mean well, if we keep on sinning because we're going on what God taught, what God taught me 40 some years ago, it's not that that's not good anymore. Come on. All of us learned our ABCs years ago. And it's what we use when we're writing and when we're reading. But we're not still at preschool ABCs. We've gone on. Some of us write books. Do you see? It's not that you don't move in what God already gave but you always stay fresh with him. So like Isaiah, when his train fills the temple, you see what you need to see and you don't reproach yourself. No. God gives you to move in righteousness and he does the cleansing. None of us can justify ourselves. If you're doing it, you're already wrong. If you catch yourself justifying your, your position or why you did what you did, you want to stop in mid-syllable. God is the one who justifies. That's any and every situation, circumstance, big or small. But righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. 
You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit, and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent, and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high, and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to His glory, His virtue, and His praise. You are elected to His power, His loving kindness, and His grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the Word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify Him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. Thank you.